Hey, I'm Manuel Vargas. I'm a professor of philosophy here at the University of California, San Diego. My father's from a tiny little town in the mountains of the state of Guerrero in Mexico. He uh, grew up in a very rural place, a place called Tlanipatlan, uh, where, uh, that where his family, they were native Nahuatl speakers and, uh, and his father learned Spanish as an adult, uh, partly to access education for his kids. And, uh, and my mother is from here in California. She grew up in the Central Valley and, uh, and, and that's where they met. And that's where I grew up was here in the Central Valley of California. So education was really important for uh, both my parents' families. So my mother, uh, um, she went to a, a local community college in Sacramento, uh, transferred to UC Davis. That's where she did her undergraduate education. And, uh, and, and the thought was she was of a generation where, where education had really kind of opened up for women. And it was a super important thing for women to get an opportunity to get educated and to, to receive an opportunity to, to join the workforce as fully as possible. And for my father, education in his family was, uh, was supposed to be a vehicle for the transformation of the well-being of the family. So he grew up in this tiny little mountain town. The whole family was eventually transplanted to Mexico City in large part because uh, the family thought this was the best chance that their 12 kids had for an opportunity to get an education. And eventually my father's educational uh, ambitions brought him to the United States where he uh, finished up his uh, undergraduate education. And, uh, and, and so when we were growing up, it was super important to my parents that we take education very seriously. Uh, it was something that he, he, uh, he really valued, my mother really valued, and they went out of their way to, to, to try to emphasize that this was going to be the path for us and, uh, and that we needed to take it really seriously. Um, I, I probably overdid it though, because I just kept going to school and at some point uh, they just said, you know, have a job and, and keep hanging out here and maybe you can start teaching some other people along the way. But in some sense, it sort of felt like, uh, for me, it was a particularly good fit and I was really glad that I had the opportunity to, to pursue those sorts of things. So I started out college in many ways, uh, retracing the steps of my, my mother in college. So I, I grew up in, in Bakersfield here in California. I went to the local community college there in Bakersfield, uh, uh, this place, Bakersfield College, home of the Renegades, for those of you keeping track at home. Um, and, uh, and, and I received a, a, a really good education there. Uh, it was the place that in many ways I sort of, uh, started to fall in love with the possibility of doing philosophy, which is the discipline that I, uh, I, I now teach and, uh, and do research in. And, uh, and, and when I was an undergraduate at, at Bakersfield College, I continued to have this sense though that I wanted to keep going to school and a natural thing to do was to, to transfer. And so I went to, to UC Davis uh, as a transfer student and, uh, and did my undergraduate degree there. Uh, so college for me was a lot of fun. I mean, in the sense that, that it, uh, it was unbelievable to me that there was a place where lots of smart, thoughtful people took ideas really seriously and that there was an opportunity where you could have conversations with people who, who cared about these sorts of issues and were passionate about ideas and wanted to understand how the world was put together and where you could take classes from people who'd spent their lives studying these sorts of things. So college was a, was a pretty magical place for me. So one of the things that was really important for my experiences of getting through higher education was, uh, was mentorship. But a lot of times effective mentorship doesn't start just in college. It starts from having um, models, mentors, uh, um, figures who kind of can, can chart the way for you earlier than that. So uh, I was really lucky in high school. I had a couple of teachers who uh, first uh, exposed me to philosophy, first exposed me to the idea that um, that ideas and arguments could matter for how we understand the world. And, uh, and I was really lucky to get a high school education that primed me to be thinking about those things. And it was in many ways a sort of education in place that a lot of people might not have thought was an ideal place to, to go to school. I went to a large public high school, East Bakersfield High School, by objective metrics, it's supposed to be a pretty unremarkable place to go to school. It turned out to be a really remarkable place to go to school in part precisely because of teachers and mentors. And then when I got to college, 
you know, at that point, the, 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 the opportunities had already been planted in my mind, and I was given the, the opportunity to let those things grow, to be able to build an education for myself that was responsive to the things that I wanted. And when I got to, to Davis, my thought was I was going to go to, to law school. My, my ambition was to become a, a lawyer. Why was it to, uh, my ambition to become a lawyer? It wasn't because I actually knew any lawyers. It was just because that seemed to be the kind of thing that you did for financial security to improve the possibilities for one's family. Uh, it was the kind of thing that people seemed impressed by when you told them that you wanted to be a lawyer. And I said, sure, why not? That sounds good to me. And so, uh, so, so that was the plan all along. But at some point, a number of my undergraduate teachers, and here I'm thinking of, of G.J. Matty and David Kopp, uh, at, and uh, Phil Clark, who were all at the time in the philosophy department at UC Davis, uh, at various points in time, they had suggested to me or, or made reference to the possibility of going to graduate school in philosophy. And this was just something I had never thought about at all. I mean, I, I, I thought I was going to go to law school. Uh, but but uh, but uh, once or twice they would bring it up, and and at some point I finally said something to the effect of, "Look, you know, I I can't go to to I can't go to graduate school in philosophy. Um, that just is going to cost money that I don't have. At least with a law degree, I, I can be relatively uh, confident that I'll be able to make some money downstream to pay off those bills. But but what does one do with a with a, a, a PhD in philosophy? Like, what crazy person would choose that for themselves?" Uh, and so, um, and so I was just, I, I kind of dismissed that, the, the idea outright, but, but one of my teachers, uh, JJ Maddie said, well, you know, look, if you do it right, it shouldn't cost you anything at all. And this was a great surprise to me. I, I, I paused and I was just like, wait a minute, let me get this straight. So, so you're telling me that I can get someone to pay me to study the things I'm interested in. And then, you know, I do that for four, five, six, seven years or what, however long it turns out to be. And at the end of it, they give me a degree. And I was just convinced this was a scam and I wanted in on this scam. This just seemed like a tremendous, uh, tremendous opportunity. And I thought, you know, look, if it doesn't work out at the end of the, all of this, uh, I can go to law school anyway. And, uh, and so that was the plan. I was going to go to go to law school eventually anyhow, but I could do this in the interim. I could pay some bills, I could get paid to study the things I was interested in, and I could get an education and, and get a degree. And so, uh, you know, I don't know how many years later, uh, any day now, I'm going to go off to law school and finish off that plan. So that's, that's the idea. So one of the, the things that was a really kind of important and formative experience for me while I was at Notre Dame uh, had to do with a requirement that the uh, graduate program had for all of the students who were going to get a PhD in the program. At the time, you had to demonstrate the ability to, to read in at least two foreign languages. And so I met with the director of graduate studies and I came in and I said, so I'm trying to figure out what foreign language I want to do. I've got, um, I was just figured I would use Spanish as one of my foreign languages. And so I just needed to figure out what the, the second foreign language was going to be. And the graduate director looked at me a little puzzled and said, well, what are you talking about? Um, you can't use Spanish as, as one of your foreign languages. And I was confused. And I said, well, why not? Uh, and his answer was, well, it's not one of the philosophical languages. This confused me greatly. And I said, so what, what, what do you mean it's not one of the philosophical languages? They said, well, there's no important philosophy that's been done in this language. Um, so it doesn't make sense to allow you to use it as a way of fulfilling the requirements in the, in the graduate program. Well, th this was astonishing to me. In the first place, I hadn't heard of the idea of philosophical languages. And, and in the second place, it just seemed incredible to me that this language that is so widely spoken by so many people across the planet and was historically super important in, uh, in the history of uh, European expansion, that uh, somehow there was never any philosophy that had been, uh, been, been done in this language. And so we went back and forth a, a fair amount. And, uh, and eventually the agreement was that I could use Spanish as my language, so long as I could demonstrate that I was going to use it for research. And, uh, and I thought, well, if this is as, as good as it's going to get, I'll take the deal. But I, I left noting uh, to, the, to the director of graduate studies that, that so far as I could tell, I would be the first person in the history of the program who had to show that the languages that he or she was choosing were in fact going to get used for research. 
Now, I think at this point, the the, the director of graduate studies he, at, at the at that program, he was uh, he was just you know doing his job, as it were. He was reflecting the basic presumptions of the discipline and the way in which people thought about these things. But this turned out to be a really important and formative experience for me in graduate school, because it got me started thinking about the question of well, what do we mean by philosophy and who does philosophy? Where is it done? And in particular, is it really true that no interesting, good, valuable, worthwhile philosophy had ever been done in the Spanish language? And this got me started thinking about these questions and it got me interested in the question about whether or not philosophy was done in Spanish and in particular, whether or not it had been done in Latin America. And so when I decided to leave uh, Notre Dame to go to, to warmer climates with more tortillas, uh, I, I came back out to California and I transferred graduate programs and uh, started, uh, started a PhD program at Stanford. And one of the things that was really great for me about, uh, about coming into Stanford is I continued to do research in, um, in, in questions in, in what we think of as kind of contemporary uh, Anglophone or analytic philosophy. So I was interested in questions about free will and moral responsibility and the history of ethics. Uh, but I also came in with a vibrant interest in trying to think more about this question about whether or not there was philosophy in Spanish, and in particular, whether or not there was Latin American philosophy. And I was in a context or a university situation where there were resources available for people to, to undertake their own independent research projects. And this became a, an increasingly active part of, of what I was doing in graduate school. And so uh, at Stanford, I had this kind of tremendous experience of where so long as I did the kinds of things that the department wanted me to do, they were completely okay with me then spending gobs of time over in Latin American studies uh, and spending my summers living in Mexico City, doing research on the history of philosophy in, in Latin America. And it just turned out to be a terrific opportunity to, to learn about lots of different things in a university that, uh, and in a kind of departmental context where there was no opposition to me doing it. It wasn't as though they had any in-house expertise for it but they were willing to let me go and do those kinds of things. And there were the resources to support my interest in these things. And sure enough, it turns out that there is a ton of philosophy that has been written in Spanish. Uh, there's a, you know, even within Latin America and just looking at, at the Spanish language, which is of course only one of many languages spoken in what we now call Latin America. Um, you know, there's a roughly 500 year long history of philosophy getting produced in Spanish. And it just turns out that the US Academy hasn't much studied it, hasn't much taught it. And, uh, and so this has been one of the kinds of things I've spent some part of my professional career uh, trying to, to, to br help bring to life, to teach these things and to, to make it the case that, uh, you know, hopefully 20 years from now, uh, there's not some other kid coming from the Central Valley in California or anywhere else in the United States who shows up to a graduate program in philosophy and is told that there is no philosophy that was written in Spanish. And so you can't use Spanish as your foreign language for a PhD program. So my path to UCSD was a, a really roundabout one. I wanted to go here for graduate school, failed to get in uh, and, uh, and, and kept trying to get a job here. And I just couldn't convince anybody to hire me. And I had just, you know, I, I thought like I refused to surrender the dream. UCSD is a place I want to be. And, and, uh, and eventually, uh, through a series of accidents, I had to pay off a lot of people. Uh, but uh, no, that part's a joke. Um, but the, uh, I, I, uh, I had the really good fortune about five, five or six years ago of getting hired here at UCSD. And it's been a, a tremendously positive experience. Uh, the department has been super supportive. The university as a whole has been super supportive of the work I, I get to do. And it's been a tremendous privilege to get to have the students in particular here. Um, it's just, uh, our, our students are, are, are terrific and, uh, and, and have wide ranging interests. And I feel really fortunate to, to get to be a faculty member here at UCSD. So uh, a typical day usually uh, involves uh, me getting up around five in the morning, give or take. Uh, I try to avoid uh, stepping on my dog as I leave my bedroom, and try to avoid waking my spouse up as I get up. Uh, and then I usually try to work for a couple hours. Uh, so responding to emails, you know, reading, uh, you know, whatever assignments are due or uh, those sorts of things. Um, then uh, depending on the quarter and how things are set up, I might go into campus and, and teach a couple of classes. 
Uh, there's a fair amount of meeting with, uh, with graduate students. So this is gonna be a, an important part, depending on what kind of academic job you have, you, you, you do more and less of these sorts of things. Um, and then a big part of what I, I try to do is to block out large chunks of time where I do the research aspect of my job. So for philosophers, um, though it's gonna sound silly, a, a big part of what we're doing is, is um, reading, writing, and thinking. Um, so it can look like you're not doing anything for long periods of time if you're trying to work out how it is a set of ideas hang together. And so, uh, but it turns out this is a super valuable piece of, uh, piece of the work that is um, setting aside the time to, to kind of read on some issue, think really hard about that issue, to try to work out some ideas. So a lot of my time is spent writing uh, in one way, shape or form. Uh, and then you're gonna have things like um, meetings with graduate students or reading groups or visitors coming in presenting their own research and, and providing feedback on those things. And uh, another part of the job, and this you know, maybe wouldn't happen on a typical day, but happens uh, at least in non-pandemic times with some frequency are academic conferences. So these will be moments when you get together with a bunch of other academics, who've been thinking really hard about a set of subject matters and then everybody comes to present their work to one another and, and to critique each other's work. I think this is an important part of the academic activity is the self-critical component of it. So we're trying to be self-critical about our own work when we produce it, but then when we come together as a community at large, it's partly our shared responsibility to critique each other's work. And so that's a kind of important piece about all of this. And then this all feeds back into our teaching. That is uh, what it is that you're presenting to the students, um, you know, it's partly a function about the kinds of things you're thinking about in the state of the field or the, the state of research when you're doing those things. But then sometimes in the, in the trajectory of a class or in the course of ordinary discussion, um, some issue will get brought up by a student where a student will say, yeah, but what about this? Or, you know, tell me a little more about this. Or um, I'm wondering about this. And, and that can end up transforming and changing the kinds of research that you do. So particularly in my courses in Latinx philosophy and in, uh, in the history of philosophy in Mexico, a lot of the research I've, I've done has ended up being uh, precisely driven by the experience of teaching undergraduates, uh, where some student you know, would, might remark, uh, you know, I wanna know more about this. And so then I have to go out and learn those kinds of things. Or a, a student has, you know, one of my uh, favorite memories of this is I had a student who upon reading the work of, of the Mexican existentialist, uh, Emilio Uranga, uh, had this reaction of, look, he's not talking about Mexicans, he's talking about us, Chicanos, Chicanas, um, and talking about our experiences in a particular kind of way. And, um, and I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Like Uranga wasn't, clearly wasn't thinking about those things at the time, he wrote all of this work in, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, but it resonated with students in a different kind of way. And this led me to go write a couple of papers about these kinds of things. So I think, you know, the, 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 one of the, the, the beautiful things about academic life is, uh, you know, it, uh, that it all ends up being connected. Your teaching and your research and the activities that you're doing with your students they're all interconnected. And so part of what that means is that the course of an everyday av average day of, a, of an academic can look wildly different from one day to the next. So sometimes people will ask me, um, why study philosophy? What, what's valuable about philosophy? And, uh, and this I think is maybe the easiest question to answer that there is uh, in the sense that I just think, look, in philosophy we study the questions that we have that for which we don't know how to answer those questions. So if I was gonna be fancy about this, the kind of thing I tend to say is, look, philosophy is the attempt to answer probable questions uh, in domains in which we lack widely agreed upon and reliable methods for figuring out what the truth is. So we have these questions that we wanna know. We think, look, there's, there's gotta be an answer to this question. There are probable truths here, uh, but we don't get know how to answer those questions. And part of what philosophers do is I think of philosophers as kind of, um, the advanced recon team of human knowledge, that our job is to go out into domains where we think, look, there's, there's gotta be something true or false that we could say about these kinds of things, but we don't quite know how to figure out what those things are. And, and historically, some of those questions have been questions about what's the nature of the true? What, what makes things true? What's the nature of goodness? What's the nature of, of things being beautiful? What's the nature of human freedom? What's the fundamental nature of morality? 
Uh, these are the kinds of questions that philosophers have historically answered. And then there's also other questions that philosophers have been really interested in that eventually did come to be things that we now recognize as the sciences. So if you look at the history of the sciences, for example, Isaac Newton, uh, you know, he understood himself to be writing in a branch of philosophy that was called natural philosophy. So many of, for example, many of the fields in philosophy, economics, sociology, these things grew out of the work of philosophers. And I think this is entirely unsurprising. This is what our job is in some sense. We're the folks trying to create disciplines by figuring out enough about how the world is put together to, 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 to make it possible to do more systemic research. Okay, so, so when somebody comes to me and says, okay, so what is philosophy about? That's the kind of answer I give them. But then the question is, well, so why should I study philosophy? And then I think, well, look, no one should study philosophy unless they're interested in truth, uh, goodness, freedom, the meaningfulness of human life, and what's truly valuable in this world. Uh, if you're not interested in those questions, then philosophy is a terrible kind of subject matter for you to study. But if you care at all about questions about like what makes a life meaningful, you care at all about what it is to be free, you care at all about what the difference is between right and wrong, you care at all about the nature about how the world is built and what's the nature of truth, uh, what it is that we can hope and aspire to, then I think you absolutely should take philosophy. Philosophy is the place where these questions attempt to get answered in the most deep and systematic ways that we have. So advice for people who are taking philosophy, I think it's uh, do as best you can as trying to be a four-year-old. Uh, that is, four-year-olds are terrific at ans asking the question, why? Um, why and just repeating it until they get some answer. And, uh, and I think in many respects, that's part of what we're trying to do in philosophy is to get people to go back to their inner four-year-old and begin to ask those questions. So my recommendation for anybody who's taking a philosophy class, who's thinking about philosophy, Read the work with an open mind, but also ask these questions, ask these challenging questions and find the topics that grab you. The domain of philosophy is tremendous. There's just a ton of different things you can study out there, uh, but I think it also gives us the tools to, to think reflectively about what kinds of things matter to us. And I think that's one of the really tremendous things about uh, the, uh, the American university system is that we have these opportunities to study these kinds of questions where it's not just go and get a job, but here's a way to begin to think about what actually matters in your life. So I think uh, one of my recommendations for students who are in college is to go out of their way to find community. And I think there are a lot of different ways in which you can find community. Uh, there's no kind of one size fits all recipe. So for some people that means being a part of an organization or a group that has shared interests. Uh, for other people, that means being part of, or of an organization or group that is committed to certain kinds of activities where, where maybe it's charitable work or maybe it's uh, trying to reshape the world that we live in in some way. I think there are a lot of ways to do this, but a lot of it involves going out and, and, and being ready to invest time and to connect with other sorts of uh, folks. And sometimes you'll find community with folks you never anticipated that you would find community with. And so I think, this is a super important part of the process of college is because you get moved from wherever the conditions were that you'd been living before, oftentimes for undergraduates, it's the, the town or the community or the family that they lived in. And now you're moving into a community of the mind, but the community of the mind is only one part of the story because all of us have uh, attachments, commitments, convictions, and, and affiliations that are not gonna be captured by life just in the university. And so I think, uh, my recommendation for students is jump into the university, make those connections with other people that are there, but also retain connections to things outside of the university, to communities, whether it's, it's a, a church group, whether or not it's a, it's a group in your hometown that is co committed to these things. Retain those kinds of connections because those are going to be the things that sustain you uh, through the difficult challenges of undergraduate education and beyond. And, uh, uh, and I think you know, people who live in community are invariably over time much happier than people who don't have these kinds of things. And I think this is part of feeding the, the roots of, of people's ability to, to learn and sustain the intellectual life as well.